Hey guys, still here, and welcome back to War Game Red Dragon Ash and Shadows. Now, I'm on 2.42 for this mod at the moment, and 2.42 brings quite a few very important changes. I'm going to read a few from the patch notes. Air to air missiles have been radically altered, damage has been lowered, and critical chance has been increased. The critical chance hit tables have been adjusted, and the details of the new critical hit tables are in the ANS player's guide. Now, um, I'm going to be covering Canada, Canada, really, Canada, Canada, today, and um, let's very quickly jump to the air tab to show you exactly what that means. Air to air missile, 2 HE. Second air to air missile, 3 HE. Aircraft strength, 12. I haven't tested these yet, but I'm really interested to see exactly how they work. Now this is not the only change to the air to air missiles. They've also been boosted in speed. So the air-to-air -air missile speed uh, boost should mean that aircraft are potentially easy to intercept. And if you get a critical hit on them, well, you might actually be able to shoot them down. That's not the only change. The other change for 2.42 is that Yugoslavia has been upgraded to the Danube Pact. You can see them over here. This is Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania and Ukraine, plus equipment from former East Germany all nations along the Danube River, hence the name. So I'm not going to be covering this one in this particular episode. I can give you a quick snapshot of uh, some of the units that you can see in this particular deck. But as I mentioned, I'm going to be doing that in a separate video. And if you want to make sure that this thing gets covered sooner, be sure to click the link in the description which says vote here for your country. And that way you can upvote the specific country that you want me to cover. Anyway, back to Canada. Or sorry, there's one more change that I want to cover. Uh, a new class of anti-heavy weapons have been added. And this is units that are particularly good against those units with the heavy tag. So uh, let's find a heavy tag volunteer. The commander marines over here. They're generally very hard to kill. But there is a new class of anti-heavy weapons. Uh, they have 1.1 HE damage to make them stand out. This means the P90s, the MP7s, and the new weapons in the 6.5mm CBG caliber have been added, or have been the main recipient of this upgrade. They do slightly more damage to all infantry types. Now, let's see, who carries the P90? Uh, not these guys. Come on, somebody must carry the P90. Here we go, FNP90. Sapors. These guys have a HE value of 1.1. If you compare that to the Rima with FAMAS, they have a value of 1. So these are going to be slightly more effective against heavy infantry. And this also goes for, as mentioned, the MP7 and some of the other weapons in the 6.5mm caliber. That's another important change, meaning that units which have this particular weapon or one of these weapons are going to be more useful against heavies and you might have an easier time dislodging those heavies from buildings that you really don't want them in. Right, now back to Canada. Uh, before I do so, somebody mentioned, why don't you do these things in a deck builder? The reason for that is that if I do it in the armory, I can quickly show you comparisons with other nations. If I go do that in the deck builder, I can't. And while the deck builder might show you availability, and the type of unit slots and transports and all stuff. Uh, I prefer to do it in the armory, especially because I can compare how a unit might stack up against a unit that it will come up against in the field. Alright, now finally on to Canada. Command units, nothing too much has been changed here. We still have the command squad. They do however have a new transport. This is the TAPV. Good optics reconnaissance vehicle with an autonomy of 1200 kilometers. That's a hell of a range. Mark 19 grenade launcher on it. Good optics, good off-road speed. Now, I wouldn't really transport my command infantry in a situation like this, but I can definitely see this working for command squad or commando squads or uh, higher tier infantry and allowing those to also get a bit of grenade launcher support or use them as a separate reconnaissance vehicle. Other than that, we have the Grizzly, the Bison, the Kodiak, and this is a new one. It might have the unit model of an LEV, but don't pay too much attention to that. Armed with a heavy armored or heavy Bushmaster, 4 AP on that. 
meaning that this thing is not able to damage itself if it come up against um, another Kodiak because its frontal armor is 6 and the gun only does 4 damage at max range and yes of course if you close in that damage is going to ramp up. They also come with an APS and uh, surprisingly they're not amphibious but with an off-road speed of 100 kph you should still be able to get to your destination in time. Then CH-135, or 135, nothing too stellar there. Uh, of course helicopters now have medium stealth but that's really the only change here. And then the CH-146 Griffin, uh, medium stealth helo, autonomy is okay at 460, speed's good and they have the GAU-19 which is a little bit more damaging than the 135. Let's compare these things side by side and you can see that the HE is 1.5 versus 1 and the GAU-19 also has 1 AP. There is however one particular thing that I don't... Ah, indirect fire. Okay, that's useful. That's something that the minigun doesn't have. Other command units, a uh, CP vehicle, another Iltis CP, and the Grizzly CP. Nothing really special here. Leopard AMAP command vehicle, 16 frontal armor, 10 side, 13 AP on the gun, 60% accurate. Um, pretty, well, it's a pretty okay armored command tank. And this is especially why I use the armory. If you compare that to the Armata command tank, you can see that, uh, or let's say the T80 UK. You're paying a little bit more for that. You're paying 20 points more, but you're getting a whole lot more. You're getting 5 points more frontal armor, 1 point less side armor, a little bit less top armor, but you do get a better gun, an ATGM, and an APS. So this is why I use the armory. Quick comparison. Overall, I'd say a command tank doesn't really need to do all the tricks that the T-80 command tank can do. So a Leopard command would perfectly suit your situation. Then for transports, we have the cargo Chinook, uh, the M35 cargo, and the HLVW. Nothing really special here. Let's move on to infantry. Over here we have the Black Watch Infantry. This is not really your typical line infantry, because they're a 15-man squad. Now that's pretty good of a deal for 8 points. Main armament is a C1A1 SLR battle rifle, uh, doing 40% accuracy, um, a pretty low rate of fire for a weapon of this type. So most of your anti-infantry firepower is probably going to have to come from your machine gun, the LMG here, the C6A2. And in case you're dealing with transports or vehicles up close, you have the Carl Gustav. It has 20 AP, meaning that against vehicles at closer range, especially har heavily armored ones, try to go for a side shot. As for transports, um, the only thing that I haven't covered yet is the M113A2. Well, it doesn't really need covering. And the TH-495. Four frontal armor, four side armor, a 3 AP autocannon, 25mm. And uh, you can see that is a little different from the Kodiak. Or is it? Let's have a look. Uh, the Bushmaster Furzes. Come on. Don't fight me on this. Kodiak versus a TH-495. Uh, what we have over here is a difference in the firepower. The Bushmaster somehow, with the same caliber gun, does one HE more. Sorry, one AP more. HE is the same. And they both have an APS. They have slightly different armor values, 4 versus 6. But overall, they're pretty similar. I'd say if you want to get a cheaper fire support vehicle, go for the 495. Next, Canadian Airborne. These guys come equipped with that FNP-90, which does have the 1.1 HE, so allowing it to be more damaging against enemy infantry. And especially that, in combination with the C8A3, means that you have a lot of firepower between these two. Aside from that, they're shock trained, and they have heavy tag. These guys are going to be very difficult to deal with against enemy infantry. The enemy infantry is going to have a hard time trying to dislodge them. The amount of weaponry that they carry for the M3, the amount of supplies, is a bit low. It's 6 versus the Black Watch is 9, but then again, these have 5 more guys to carry the ammunition, and these don't. But still, for 20 points, uh, plus transport, of course, you're getting a very, very good infantry unit. 
Next are the Canadian Rifles. This is your standard line infantry. 10-man squad, regular trained, uh, C7A2, battle, sorry, not a battle rifle, but assault rifle, C6A2 that I just covered, and the M72E9 law. Low on the AP, high on the rate of fire. Try to get vehicles inside of your range and then take them out. Because you really need to hit your shots. That 16 AP heat will do damage, but you're going to have to make sure you get more than one round on target. With a 45% accuracy and a low amount of ammo, that could be a bit of a challenge. Fortunately, if you are dealing with armor, these guys can also uh, fix that for you. The Eric Troop. Five-man squad, regular trained, no heavy tag. Uh, I wouldn't really expect that. 26 AP, very good accuracy, and they have 4 HE. That means that at a 1,000 meter range, they can comfortably sit back from a fight, lob a couple of Eric's missiles at the target, and do 4 HE damage against enemy infantry with every single missile that they fire. And there is a very good chance that they hit you as well. They're pretty cheap, 18 points. However... When you compare that to Canadian Airborne, you can see that the Canadian Airborne offer you a different package for almost the same price point. These are frontline troops. These are, I'd say, second-line troops, where they provide you with fire support for your Canadian Airborne. They touch things at ranges where the Canadian Airborne are not quite in range yet. And especially between these two, you're going to be seeing enemy infantry go down very, very quickly. What else? Well, we have Highlanders over here. Light infantry. They do not have a shock level training, but they have a nice assortment of weapons. Uh, they have the C782 assault rifle, the Mini-Me, and the Eryx. The Eryx, unfortunately, does not have an HE value, so it cannot against enemy or cannot engage enemy infantry. But overall, these guys are capable of taking out enemy armor, a little bit more uh, capable than the Canadian Airborne, I would say because the Canadian Airborne just don't have the range and they don't have the AP. But the Highlanders are slightly less suited, or at least that's the way that it looks, against enemy infantry, because the FNP-90 uh, has that 1.1 HE modifier, and the C7A2 doesn't. Moving on, Javelin GL, a anti-air team, three-man squad, very easy to kill off, carries six anti-air missiles at a good range, 29.75 against helos and 31.50 against planes with a very good accuracy and as I mentioned at the start of the video the HE values against aircraft have been changed so you're looking at a 2 HE I'm not really sure how that's going to translate again I haven't tested these yet I still need to look into that JTF2 Special Forces these guys are fantastic I tried them out in my video a couple weeks ago um, they were very good against enemy infantry. And not just infantry, because the Carl Gustav M4 is an upgrade over the M3 and does a little bit more AP damage. Aside from that, they have the heavy tag, safer against enemy infantry. They're fast, 30 kph, medium optics, good stealth. It's a very powerful all-round package. And you're not even paying that much more for these guys than you are for other infantry. Because you're paying as much for the JTF2 as you are for the Highlanders. And the uh, Air Canadian Airborne are just slightly cheaper. I think that at the moment JTF might be made a little bit more expensive. Because they are definitely better than the Canadian, uh, sorry, Canadian Airborne. Well, that's not strictly speaking true. They have a C8 Carbine, which is very accurate, but doesn't have the 1.1 HE. The FN Mag is about as good as the C8A3. It does, however, have slightly higher suppression, a slightly higher rate of fire, but not as good on the move, but you're getting a little bit more range. So it's a slight trade-off. I wonder what happens if you put Canadian Airborne against JTF2. I wonder who would win that fight. Moving on, LAAD airstrike, uh, sorry, not airstrike, <laughs> star streak. These things counter airstrikes. Very low HE value of only one, but again, critical values might impact that quite significantly. 
You're looking at a very good range against airplanes and a fantastic accuracy, 80%. Of course, keep in mind that you are still facing off against the enemy's ECM, which means that you're not likely to see an actual 80% hit chance or an 80% hit. But still, 80% does give you a lot of chances to hit a target. MAW, um, they are a sort of alternative to the Eryx in the sense that they can provide fire support, but you're going to have to get your MAW troops or your MAW troops a bit closer. Well, the Eryx prefer to sit back and lob their Eryx weapon at a thousand meter range. These guys prefer to get in close, use both the Carl Gustav M3 and the FNP90 to deal with enemy infantry. I think these are very interesting units because they deliver a high amount of HE, can deliver a good punch with AP as well, they have 16 ammo and overall a good rate of fire. Their rate of fire is probably far better than the rate of fire that you're getting out of the Eryx. So I think that the Maw could be another very useful addition to a Canadian airborne group. And what else do we have? Uh, the Vandus. This is... Um, what is this actually? This is an ATAA team, if that's a thing. Shock train squad, good stealth, very good. Uh, sorry, it's very small, of course. Medium optics, nothing special there. Carl Gustav M3 for anti-vehicle, RBS 70 NG for anti-air, and a C8A3 carbine to defend themselves. No heavy tag. Um, they're classed as a rifle team, but I would not really deploy them as your standard rifle team. I'd say use these in a flanking role. Try to get them behind enemy lines where they can ambush helicopters, aircraft, and try to go after high value targets with that Carl Gustav M3. And for 25 points, interestingly, they're more expensive than your JTF2. I'm not sure if that's justified, because they're more versatile, they can deal with more different threats, but they're not really good at any one thing. So let me know in the comments, do you think that this is uh, adequate? Should the Vandus be more expensive than the Special Forces? Moving on to support, where there is not a lot to cover. We have the, uh, the Leopard Marksman. Um, I don't believe that the Leopard Marksman used to be a thing. We have the Challenger Marksman uh, and the Chieftain Marksman, I think. But the Leopard Marksman is a new thing. Again, don't look at the unit model, because this is definitely a uh, Chieftain Marksman, I'm going to say. Um, but it does have quite a bit of armor. Not as much as you would expect from... where is it? The Chieftain... Sorry, the Challenger. Challenger has 16 frontal armor, this one has 11. Side armor is a little bit less as well. Overall, it's the same twin KDA system that you see on the, Ch on the Challenger, but you're paying slightly less for it. What you are getting, in exchange for a little bit less armor, is a little bit more mobility. You're getting 70 versus 55. Both are big targets, so don't expect these things to be hidden easily. But that mobility might just allow you to get from cover to cover a little faster than the Challenger Marksman can. Uh, let's see... Other than that, we have two artillery platforms over here. We have the L, uh, M109 L52 and the A4. Let me compare these side by side. The L52 RCHA has a three round burst and that's a capacity that this one lacks. That's not the only thing. As you can see, the gun is different and this translates into better range and very good dispersion for an artillery unit. 2730 is very, very low. I think that back in the vanilla game, the Caesar used to have one of the best accuracies for howitzers. Um, the M109 L52 puts that to shame. At 2730, you're looking at mortar like dispersion. Now, they only carry 24 rounds, whereas these guys carry 36. So keep in mind that you might have to resupply these things a little bit more often, but with a range of 40 clicks, or 42 almost, you can keep them next to a fob. Just make sure to move them around every now and then, because the enemy might not like it when you have a sniper back at base very, very accurately wiping out targets left, right, and center. So move them around after shooting. 
Next up, ADATs and the MMEV. I'm going to compare these side by side as well because they have a similar weapon type, but they're slight changes. They both carry the ADATs. However, this one carries eight missiles, this one carries four. The stats on the missile are exactly the same. Then we have the Iris SL on the MMEV, and that's something that the ADATs doesn't have. This one has slightly worse range against airplanes and helicopters, but it adds another fire and forget punch that the ADATs doesn't have. Aside from that, you're getting the MMEV at a lower price tag, 55 versus 75, and they are more mobile. They are amphibious, they're very fast off-roaders, and their autonomy is more than twice as good as the ADATs. So, I'd say try to spread out more of the MMEV than you do with the ADATs. Um, and please do not use the ADATs in an anti-ground roll. They used to be very capable in a situation like that, because they have that 25 AP. But in vanilla game you don't have to put up with APS and defensive units or defensive weaponry. This one does. So the ADATs in an anti-ground roll is no longer as capable as it once was. Tanks. Not a whole lot of tanks for the Canadians. But then again, they have infantry. What we have over here is the Leopard 2A6 Canadian. L44 smoothbore gun, doing a, a respectable 22 AP damage. Very accurate, both on the move and sitting still. HE is only 3. Um, I prefer my AT or my anti-infantry weapons, so my HE damage to be 4. And surprisingly, the Vickers does have four, but the L44 smoothbore and the L55 smoothbore don't have that. Now, frontal armor at 23 is very good. It's going to keep the enemy at bay for a while, but keep in mind that some units have very high AP, uh, going up to 27 on the... Oh, what was that? That was the Russian thing. Uh, where are you? The T95, I think it was. Yeah, 27 AP on that. That means that your 23 frontal armor is not going to be enough. And trust me, you will see the T95. I just hope I won't see it in the campaign anytime soon. Anyway, um, you have both a smoke discharger for defense as well as an APS, but you don't carry too many charges. Well, sorry, I thought it was three. You carry six charges. That makes this situation quite a bit different. These are very survivable tanks. Just don't go up against the super heavies. For that, the Leopard 2A6 uh, M might be a little better. Because you're getting a little bit more punch. Quite a bit more side armor, actually. Three points more side armor. And especially important is more top armor. Cluster munitions generally do around seven damage to top. These things will survive that. They will definitely take a scratch, but it won't be as bad as the uh, Leopard 2A6. So the 2A6M is an upgrade over the 2A6. And you're paying 10 points more for it. Probably has less availability as well. But overall, it's just a slightly better tank. Then we have the Leopard 2 line. Or sorry, well, sorry, the Leopard 1 line. Leopard C2. Very cheap tank, 45 points, nice and agile platform. 65 kph off-road, medium optics, it can sort of spot for itself. And I mostly use these in either a flanking role or as a supporting force for my tanks. This is something you can see me do in my Canadian uh, gameplay from a few weeks ago. And I'll link that in the description down below if you want to see these things in action. Leopard C2 Maxis, more heavily armored brother of the Leopard C2. Uh, the Maxis has 15 frontal armor and 9 side armor versus 13 and 5. The gun, otherwise, is exactly the same. Both has a smoke discharger and there's really not too much to be said. You are, however, slightly paying in mobility for the amount of armor that you're getting. This extra armor is slowing you down, but not by much. And then the Leopard C2 A map, uh, when compared to the Maxis, slightly more armor. Again, 60 kph instead of 65. Your gun is still the same, but what you do get on the A-map is the trophy APS. That's something that the Maxis doesn't have. Now for 55 points, you might be wondering why the hell would I even want an APS? You might not need it on the C2, but the C2 can share it with vehicles that don't have it. 
or that already use their own. So if you blend in a couple of C2A maps, either in front of or between your Leopard 2A6s, these can help in defeating enemy APS, or uh, sorry, in enemy ATGMs. And then finally we have the Vickers Mark 7. I used this one in the uh, replay as well. I really like them. They are so flexible. Very fast. 80 kph. Good armor. 21. It's not the best, but you're paying 95 points for this. Whereas your other options are 55 points or 135. So there's a 40 meter barrier or 40 point barrier to either side. And considering that I'm getting an upgrade from 16 to 21 for 40 points or for another 40 points to 23, that makes this Vickers Mark 7 very suitable. Not only that, but they have a very accurate gun, which has one big drawback. It's not stabilized. You do not fire the Ruak 120 on the move. Second drawback, 20 AP, but it's a heat munition. It will always do damage, but it is going to remain the same whatever range you are to the target. That's a problem. Because this means that it will be able to damage even the heaviest armored tanks at maximum range. But the closer you get, it's not like it's going to do more damage. That does give you an option. And that option is to stay at maximum range. Whereas the enemy tanks benefit from closing in, you benefit from staying at maximum range. And that's interesting. So the Vickers Mark 7 is something that you might have to uh, acquire a taste for, as it were. But once you have, I really think that you will like this tank. And not just because of the gun, but also because it has the smoke discharger and the trophy APS, as well as machine guns, which are not shown. But it's a very nice, well-rounded tank. Moving on to reconnaissance. CH-136 minigun recon helo. Special, not really. Ferret Mark 1. Uh, especially when you compare the size. It's a tiny, tiny little thing. M2 Browning on it, uh, good optics, small, very fast. However, it runs out of fuel pretty quick. 300k kilometer autonomy means that you're not very mobile. And that is a bit of a drawback for a scouting vehicle like this. Cougar Recon, the L23A1 that you see on some of the light tanks. I'm not too big of a fan of these things. While they do have a heat tag, that means they're always going to do the same amount of damage. Um, they're not stabilized, and I prefer to have my reconnaissance vehicles move about and not just sit somewhere. Well, especially these mobile ones, and especially with a mobile vehicle that can do 100 kph and has the autonomy to support that, I want this thing to be firing on the move. The Coyote fortunately can fire on the move, but does not have the same amount of AP. You're looking at 12 AP versus 4 because this is an auto cannon and this is more of a main gun. Other than that, the platform is the same. You're getting the same amount of mobility. Uh, you are, however, not getting amphibious capability on the Coyote. But the Coyote has very good optics versus good optics. Next, the Altis Scout. Not too much to be said about this. Um, just turn off the browning, park it somewhere next to an open field, and that exceptional optics will spot everything that comes your way. M113 CNR, and nothing to be said about this thing. It's a 10 point, very cheap reconnaissance vehicle. Comparing that to the Ferret, I'd say the Ferret is much more mobile, 95 kilometers per hour, and since it's wheeled, it's also going to be uh, faster on roads. But the autonomy for this thing is 450 versus 300. And this one has amphibious capability, this one doesn't. So they fit slightly different roles. Next up, for Recon Infantry, we have the Pathfinders. The Pathfinders are, um, and I especially prefer these things to have, the Carl Gustav and that AA missile, or surface-to-air missile. They have the M4 Carbine, the C8A3 uh, LSW for anti-infantry warfare. Carl Gustav M3 for AP, so anti-vehicle. Elite level of training, very good optics, very good stealth, no heavy tag. While it might be tempting to go up against enemy infantry with these guys, be careful what you're fighting. 
If you're going up against enemy infantry, the other Canadian infantry units that you have in the infantry tab are generally better options. And then Recce, um, C15 LSRW sniper rifle, range 2135 meters, AP 2, that's good. This means that you can start sniping units, and since it's a kinetic weapon, the closer something gets, the more damage you will do. I wouldn't be surprised if you get close enough with these and they're going to penetrate the side armor of a tank. I just don't know exactly how close you have to get. And of course, being an exceptional stealth unit, you might not even want to fire that weapon. Vehicles then. Um, quite a few I've already covered because they're transports. The Bison 81mm, just your standard mortar. But keep in mind that the mortar has a range or a dispersion of 2730, but the range is far less. Compare that to what I showed you before, this one, there's the mortar-like dispersion, 2730. Next, the Chimera, the tank destroyer, as it were. Um, still a heavy vehicle. For 110 points you're getting quite a lot of armor, <clears throat> but 20 will see you start to take damage. Fortunately it has 30 strength, so while it might take damage, you can actually survive taking damage for quite a while. But I would take these things at the highest veterancy that you can. For the reason of that frontal armor. Because you're going to take damage, and the more damage you take, the faster your crew is to panic. The lower their veterancy, the faster they panic. Upping the veterancy is going to reduce it, as well as reduce the amount of, um, or reduce the amount of time that they take to recover from that panic. So take these things at the highest possible veterancy, if you want to use them at all. They do, however, provide you with a very accurate gun, which does 21 AP, but is not stabilized. This thing is an ambusher, and nothing else. You don't use this as a frontline assault unit. That's what you have your leopards for. <clears throat> uh, next up, the Cougar Mark 11. This is an upgraded version of the Bushmaster. This is the Bushmaster 3. 6 AP, very accurate, that stays the same. The platform is very nice. You're looking at 6 frontal armor, uh, amphibious capability, off-road is good, autonomy is good. I really like this vehicle. Definitely a nice fire supporter. Next up, a couple of transports. Um, next we have TOTU missiles. Range on these is not that good. The punch is very good. The challenge is landing those missiles on the target and trying to bypass the enemy APS systems. That's going to be the challenge. Um, they are very mobile, but the enemy, if it has an ATGM, will be lobbing that back at you. And while the enemy, let's say it's a tank, might have APS and will just easily swat away your missile, you cannot do the same thing. That makes the LV-3 TUA a bit of um, a complicated unit to use. I wouldn't really trust it too much. This one, the LAV TUA 2B, is slightly better because um, while this thing does have the 25 AP, it has to go through the frontal armor. This thing goes through the top armor, has slightly better range and even more missiles, 12 versus 16. It's a different way of attacking a target. Um, again, you're dealing with an APS. Try not to uh, lose too many missiles to the APS. The M113 TUA is just another 2-2 carrier. Nothing special there. Uh, a couple of transports, another mortar system. And finally, the Wolverine. The Wolverine is an AA vehicle. <clears throat> what exactly it's doing in the vehicle tab, I'm not quite sure. But this is one more vehicle that, as far as I'm concerned, should be in support. It's an AA... Uh, what is it? An AA LAV of sorts? The problem is that the missile has a little bit less range than you would probably like it to be. You're looking at 2975 versus helos, 3150 against aircraft. Accuracy is good. HE again is a question mark. Mobility is very good, and the cheap is quite uh, the cheap. <laughs> it 
sorry the price is quite low it's a cheap unit um, it can definitely get around 100 kph off-road and 50 kph uh, amphibious you're going to be maneuvering this thing quite a lot but whether you're going to get into range that remains to be seen it's a bit of a question this thing helos then um, these two are transports <clears throat> then we have the 135 gunship I don't believe that this thing has been changed too much maybe it got a little bit more AP but that's about it and the CH-146 tow is carrying the tow-2 missile that I just mentioned um, still has the same issues another issue that you have to contend with with this helicopter versus something like the uh, LEV is that while it may have a stabilizer I would not trust that thing you simply cannot afford to miss because you only have four missiles this thing has 12 this thing can afford to miss this thing not so much so what we have over here is a potentially uh, lacking helicopter tab for anti-tanks you don't really have that many options let's see if the airplane tab makes up for that first aircraft CF 118 or 188 Hornet um, still a pretty good aircraft although it's been superseded by some of the others you're looking at exceptional air detection, good speed, 40% ECM is all right. And six fire and forget, short range missiles, two long range missiles. Let's see if the other aircraft can do better. The CF399 Gripen is an upgrade over that. It has 55% ECM, it turns faster, which in case of dogfighting would definitely help. But look at the accuracy for the short range missile 90%. And yes, it might only do 2 HE damage, but you're looking at critical hits or potential critical hits. You carry 4 short range, 4 long range. Um, interestingly, I would use this thing more as a dogfighter than I would this one. Try potentially to deploy the CF or the, the Hornet against Helos. I imagine they might be a little bit more useful there. And then we have the F-35A Canadian long-range air-to-air warfare platform but is it that much better than the Gripen? see the long-range missile has a range of 10 kilometers with a very good accuracy and both fire and forget but you only carry two HE is higher than you're looking at with the MRAM it's four versus three the platform itself has less HE or sorry less ECM 50 percent versus 55 might not be much, but that 10% could save your life. And especially if it's a 155-point jet, I would prefer to save my life. And other than that, it carries the same Iris-T and it carries the same amount of them, 4 and 4. Turn radius is the same. I wonder how effective the, or how much more effective, the 35A is going to be versus the Gripen. And there is one element that I haven't covered. Stealth. Very good versus poor. They're going to see this thing coming a mile away. Well, actually, 10 miles away. This one, maybe not so much. So, hmm, maybe you could try using the F-35A uh, without the long-range air-to-air missile. So you disable that weapon, you bring it in, and try to fire four short-range Iris T's at the target when you're suddenly appearing out of stealth. That might work. It might lie to get the jump on enemy aircraft. Next up, Hornet, Cluster Bomber. This is one of the anti-tank options that you have in the aircraft tab. Uh, I hope there's more. Yeah, there's one more. Uh, drops a couple of cluster munitions on top of a target. Range is okay, but keep in mind that you have the potential to go up against 10 kilometer anti-air platforms. That puts the Hornet in a bit of a tough spot because let's say you're looking at an enemy air platform oh, sorry an enemy anti-air platform uh, let's say you're facing oh I don't know the Danube Pact and the enemy has deployed the don't they have any long-range AA yeah they do the Newa M1 you're going to have to fly through about four kilometers 
of anti-airplane missile range that the NEWA or NEVA has with your Hornet before it drops munitions. This thing has an 80% accuracy. You're fighting back with 40% ECM. I still wouldn't risk it. I think it's still quite risky to send it in. Fortunately, you can escort that thing with an EMQ-4C electric Triton. 50% ECM, but more importantly, jammer pods. This thing will never be able to actually defeat an enemy tank or an enemy AA unit. Not so much in killing it off, but it will do damage to it. It will do morale damage, so it will shut it down. And that way, uh, for 70 points, they make a good escort for the Super Hornet. And then finally, we have, um, sorry, for the, the standard Hornet. The Super Hornet could also use an escort, but it has slightly higher ECM. You're looking at 60% ECM. Range is the same, but this is an HE bomber versus a cluster bomber. Also, it carries the Iris T, so that's those short slash medium range air to air missiles. And the turning radius is quite good, making this a nice multi role aircraft. But for 115 points, um, you cannot really afford to lose it. It's pretty expensive. And then we have the Paveway. It's the final aircraft. Paveway carries three Paveway 3 bombs, laser guided bombs at that, 20 HE. They have no dispersion because they're laser guided. Range is good. And since they're fire and forget, you can drop them and just leave them to go all by themselves. That's quite handy. They also have four Maverick anti tank missiles. Range is good, 4.7 kilometers. Accuracy is really good for a missile, 60%. AP is 30. Keep in mind, APS. This is not your one shot anti tank solution anymore. They're very expensive, 160 points. I wonder how this thing reacts to Winchester. Because I imagine that you might uh, bring in this aircraft and it just goes, yep, I dropped my paveways and I'm evacing. In which case, you have these perfectly good anti-tank missiles which are not being used. That would be a shame. So how exactly this thing ev uh, responds to evac Winchester, I don't quite know. We're going to have to do some testing about that. Anyway, that is the Canadian deck. Um, emphasis is definitely on infantry. They have some really good options there, like the Canadian Airborne, uh, the Highlanders, they have the JTF-2, the Maul, the Van Dues. They are very flexible in uh, infantry on infantry warfare. Tank warfare, they're all right. They're not stellar. They don't have those super heavy tanks like the Americans do, but they can pretty much manage. Reconnaissance is okay, nothing too special. Vehicles mostly are fast. And I'm not just looking at the vehicles from this tab, but also the transports here. Uh, if you're looking at the Kodiak, 100 kph, uh, you're looking at the Bison, 100 kph. These guys can get into position fast. And once they're there, the infantry can hold their ground. The Chimera, more of a tank sniper of sorts. Again, the 75 accuracy is very good, but it doesn't have stabilizer and the armor's a bit lacking. Helos are very lacking. And aircraft are, uh, well, up to the job, I think. But there's one aircraft that you're missing, and that's the Seed. And especially considering that Seed can now target both anti-tank, or sorry, um, artillery and anti-air. Not having a capability that does that is a bit of a drawback. So keep in mind that you might have to tandem this deck with another one in order to make it more effective. And for a coalition... What are they in? Uh, they're in Norforce. And if you go for Norforce, then you do have seed options. Uh, I believe. Eventually. Yeah, here. BAE Tyrannus. It has uh, the Armat missile. So if you're going for a coalition deck instead of just a Canadian deck, you're going to be sacrificing some activation points, but you get a lot more flexibility. Anyway, that's it for the Canadians. Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments. And again, if you want to vote for the next country to review in the Armour Review, be sure to do that through the description link. Upvote the country of your choice, and I'll happily look into that very soon. 
And of course, tomorrow, there's another episode for the campaign, Second Korean War. For now, thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you soon for more.